nation put all the students up there pranked when I looked up every student had one of those placards you see at basketball games with my face on it <laughs> so if you think I'm not good looking you ought to see a hundred of me at one time and the big problem was a lot of the students co took it back to their dorm rooms and, it, and my face was in some females dorm rooms on Instagram and Facebook and the Chancellor found out about it <laughs> and I said this is not good so, uh, it was a great day and I always love being up here and uh, I want to speak a little bit about the things going on in the textile business from my perspective then introduce our main speaker today but I'm Derek Close and I run a South Carolina textile upstart called, called Springs Creative. But my main claim to fame is being one of the classmates of the Poston brothers, who let's just say we entered the NC State School of Textiles in the late 70s. Is that all right, Charles Thomas? There you are. I'm still in the textile business dealing with the Walmarts of the world, that a lot of you know about, but also dealing with the likes of 3M, Amazon, Fabric.com, Jet.com, Wayfair, Tebow, Kravit, Carol Fabrics, J and J Flooring, and dozens of others, is, and it's what is becoming a very convoluted and fascinating industry. Dr. West talked about the spacer fabric business we're in. We don't make any of it. We import it, but we're selling it to Tesla and 3M and Simmons and Serta and Tempur-Pedic and all those kind of things and benefit every day from things going on here at the textile school. Also, I like to make sure everybody knows we're selling things and doing things with people like Alice Mills and Inman Mills and Copeland Mills and Hammer Mills, a lot of them here today, that aid and abet what we do and add value to the Made in USA textile supply chain is very, very important, critical to all of us going forward. But my main job this morning is teeing up our speaker. I'm Derek Close, spelled correctly as D-E-R-I-C-K. <laughs> Our special guest, Derek, D-E-R-E-C-K, which I've never heard of anybody spelling their name that way. <laughs> Derek Wittenberg is our special guest here this morning. Born 57 long years ago in Glenard, Maryland, Derek met America from DeMatha High School, but entertained America when leading NC State's Magical Championship 1982-1983. Derek started his coaching career serving as an assistant under Jim Valvano and then be began his tour of America by serving at George Mason, Long Beach State, Colorado, West Virginia, and Georgia Tech. Derek, that was a pretty nice way to see the country. <laughs> Derek then served as head coach of both Fordham and Wagner before rejoining the Wolfpack family in 2013. He still serves numerous news services and ESPN and still aspires to get back in the documentary business, having directed possibly the most popular 30 on 30 ever produced. Congratulations. While his culinary pursuits were quickly put to rest after the launch of the Wittenberger, <laughs> Derek remains quite possibly the best known and popular Wolfpack personality ever. He is an active member of the V Foundation's Board of Directors and had his jersey retired at NC State and is a proud member of the DeMatha Hall of Fame. Derek, as a lot of us alumni here today, serves as a great ambassador for our university and helps publicize all the athletic and academic progress NC State is still making. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to have with our textile family here today, coach and ultimate NC State ambassador, legend Derek Wittenberg. I uh, uh, just want to say uh, thank you for your invite. I was all excited. Sean um, said I got this great parking space all set up for me, and I go out there, and I, uh, the parking space is taken, and I get on the phone to talk to Sean. I says, Sean, who in the heck have my parking space? She says, I think it's Derek Close. <laughs> Because sure Derek stole my carpet space, but I, I want to tell you a little bit. We, we appreciate Derek so much what he has done, and all of you, but uh, and Derek in particular, because I got to know him a little bit. Because a lot of times they don't really get to know the individual. You see me on the basketball court, and you don't know what kind of person I am, whatever the things I've been doing in my life. But Derek Close has been uh, an outstanding alumnus for us. He's been outstanding for our state. 
and what he's done for the textiles business and his family. We certainly appreciate him and thank you for all of you have done and can continue to do for NC State. Thank you, Derek Close. Derek, I got one of your, your company tiles here too, and I paid a whole lot of money for this. Sure you did. But, but it's got it's got the NC State uh, the PAC textile schools. Had a wonderful visit down uh, here the other day with textiles. I, I never imagined uh, the impact of what textiles has done for for all of us. And uh, I started looking at all the labels and everything, and I. Realized that Haynes, big partner of us, and I uh, probably got some Haynes on right now. All of us probably got some Haynes. And all my t shirts were Haynes, but uh, a lot of partners that the textiles are certainly involved in, and Haynes being in Winston Salem, uh, learned a lot about them and what they do. But before I continue, I want to show you a, a short film, uh, real quick, uh, about what we all do survive in events. Well, it's, 30, it's been 35 years ago. How many NC State students were here during that time? We got a few. Any Carolina people in here? Four. Is it one? Huh? Four. Four. One. One. You, you excuse. <laughs> but, uh, I, I wanted to show you, share that with you because um, you know, although it was 35 years ago, it's just like uh, anything else. I, I, I picked the title Survive in Advance because that's what we do every day. And uh, you mentioned, Derek mentioned that that is probably the most watched documentary in the world, but it was ESPN's, and I brought this, it was ESPN's uh, first two hour film and the first Emmy Award winning film that they sent me in the, uh, sent this to my office. And when they sent it to my office, I thought it was in a big black box. And uh, I thought my wife, had, oh my gosh, she didn't bought something, I can't afford it. I'm looking at it. <laughs> I got an armed guard coming to me, Mr. Wittenberg, would you sign here? I'm getting my credit card. I said, no credit card needed. And this Emmy Award came out. And how did that come about? You know, you talk about creativity, you talk about leadership. It was during a time, this was developed during a time when I was actually fired at Fordham University. I was a long time coach. And sometimes, just like in your profession, textiles, you know, North Carolina, the textile business was hot at one time, and then you had to make adjustments and competition and business moving. It, it, was, it, was, an, it was an adjustment that I had to be creative. I had to uh, read, I had to find out who I was and what I was about. And so it took two years to actually get ESPN to say yes for that. Because I always remember what the great and the late Muhammad Ali would say. Don't forget to bet on yourself. See, during the tough times of leadership, people always think that when you're going good, it's easy to lead. But when it's time to lead and the time to pick yourself up, it's about the tough times. Don't forget to bet on yourself. This was an idea. This was a vision that I had. I wanted to tell a story about our team that would resonate with everybody else across the country. I wanted to empower people to say, we did something or part of something that was bigger than ourselves. That's what made that special. It was, it's, at the end of the day, it's a championship, it's a game, but how do we persevere during that whole time, during the whole season, 35 years ago? How did, uh, how did our leader, Jim Valvano, the one who set the tone in terms of leadership, making us believe his vision that this was all possible? One thing that people forgot Jim as a leadership, what he did when he first came in. We talk about a kid from New York City coming down south to North Carolina and embraced North Carolina in the history of North Carolina basketball. Appreciated, embraced it. He embraced it. But what he did was he empowered us about the destiny, about the vision, about <coughs> all things are possible. 
It's just like when you come up with different ideas in terms of uh, products. I was going down here when I took a visit and I saw these kids and they were developing this product of going into uh, with surgeries, about going to your arteries. And they was just so passionate about developing this product for this particular company. And I saw the excitement in their face about developing something and, and creating something. Now I know a company had the opportunity to, of, of sending them this information, they wanted them to develop this product, but you can see that they, they took ownership of this idea. And we all have ideas and we created our businesses. And Chris said, because we believed in one thing in being successful. And that's all we did in terms of the 83 championship. But what they didn't know is that it's ongoing. Leadership and achievement is ongoing. It doesn't stop. Once the, that was 35 years ago, and I didn't rest on my laurels. Just like you, you started a company, some failed, some continued. Because, but, but failure is, is short-lived. So if you speak about leadership, I don't know a lot about the textile business. But I do understand, and I've been around great leadership. I'm still today trying to seek more knowledge from great leaders. You can learn from other successes and sometimes failures from other leaders. This is why we here at this conference to talk about leadership. Leadership is not about leadership one-on-one. -on -one. You get step by step. This is what leadership is. Leadership is, you don't know how it's going to work out. But one thing I understand about going forward and setting the tone as a leader is that you have to believe in yourself and stay the course. I was turned down three, three times by ESPN. Now here it is, I'm on the Jimmy V Foundation board. I'm working at ESPN. I reached out to CBS, I reached out to TNT, they all said no. I reached out to ESPN twice, they said no. I was persistent and I believed that this was going to be something special and I stayed with it and they finally signed on to it. Just like in your endeavors, everything does not work perfectly. It's just not going to happen in your family lives, in your business life, it's not going to be perfect. The question is, what are you going to do when those rocky times come? That product developed didn't quite catch on. They didn't invest like you wanted. Derek always tell, I always hear Derek when I talk to him, he says, you're going to make it happen. You're going to make it happen. What you doing there? You're going to make it happen? But that's great leadership. As as he could have been a great coach if he let me shoot the ball most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all part of leadership is, 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 is your attitude regardless to the good times or the bad times. Being unshaken about when things don't go, go well. It's easy to lead well. When, when things are going good, it's easy. But that's what I love about the challenge in constantly learning about leadership. Listen, each individual in here, no matter what the age, no matter where you're in your life, you're all telling your story. You're all telling your story about surviving events. It's your story. Now, whether it's going on film is another question, but it's your story. And I'm telling you, you can make it happen. There's all kinds of great um, examples out there, not just in sports. Everybody looks at sports and textiles in this room and every sector like great stories of success. But they all of them persevere. Each and every one of them. That's the people I seek. A lot of times it's about in leadership because you're in your business. It's who you surround yourself with. What individuals you surround yourself with. 
who you confide in. Sometimes you got to listen to somebody else who've gone through certain situations, who've had certain successes. That's all part of leadership. And everybody talks about the art, I call it. The art of work ethic. What does that mean? The art of working. Ah, you got to work hard. I think a lot of people work hard. But I give you, I give you an example. If you don't work at all, you will fail for sure. That's what I used to tell my athletes. See, in coaching for 33 years, all you do is speak to a team and a group. And everybody across the country and every business and every city, everybody's working hard. But are you committed? Are you making the right sacrifices? Are you bought into the vision? And are you empowering the people that work with you? See, in leadership, it has to be not about you, but it has to be about your team. That's why the last 25 years I've gone across the country and I've talked to corporations about team and leadership because really a CEO or president is the coach that's coaching his team or her team. And the first thing of a coach is that I have to pay attention to my team members, my coaches, my staff, empowering them, getting them excited about the vision. And everybody in the team and the company is important. You have to make them feel that way in your organization, in your team, in your company. You have to make them feel that way. We always talk about in the team concept that what you do here is separate from what, you, what anything else. You, you got your family, you have your business, you got to keep everything separate. But it's about the team. Are you empowering your team? Are you setting forth the vision for them? Are you thinking makes possible? Are you making sure that they understand their importance? See, if you look at that 83 from Mike Warren, who probably never played local guy, from Sidney Lowe and in between Thurl Bell and all of us, each member understood their role, they embraced it, and their positive energy led to us being a successful team. We appreciated each other, we respected each other from all walks of life. I didn't even know what Bennettsville, South Carolina was. <laughs> I didn't even know, understand what Cozell was saying half the time. <laughs> but I love Cozell because he, he, he knows that he's not going to shoot the ball. <laughs> he's going to rebound and that's his role and he's accepted that role. Now that one lucky shot he had, he, lucky, he took that one lucky shot. But that's the, uh, that, that is what a team is about. It's no different in your company. It's no different in the School of Textiles. It's no different at the Sheraton Hotel. My good friend, Leon Cox from the Sheraton, went to NC State, runs the Sheraton Hotel GM. No different. No different. His daughter came to school, the School of Textiles, part of this organization. In your family. The leadership is just as important. So nobody has the blueprint on leadership. There's nobody that's an expert on leadership. You all own your own leadership. The question is how you're preparing yourself every day. Remember, remember that as a leader, it's about your team. And what you can constantly, after you achieve one thing, you have to continue to achieve another. I give you a case in point. Everybody, I just did this. You talk about a tremendous leader. I just finished the film on the 
first high school coach in the Hall of Fame. My high school coach, Paul. 1,274 games. Everybody thought I rested my laurels on the first field. But I got excited. I had to create something else because I didn't want to be a one-hit wonder. So the first high school coach in the Hall of Fame, this was shown on uh, North Carolina Public TV for the first time. So I was supporting the state of North Carolina. They didn't pay me a dime, but we're going to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you talk about a man of leadership. Not just the fact that he won 1,274 games and won 87% of the games. 42 years without a losing season. Probably should have been our coach here at NC State. I had to do a film about this man because it was about leadership. Leadership. It's like creating another product, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't stop at that one in 2013. I didn't stop at that one. Then I had to come up with another one. I had to show, I had to show ESPN that this ain't over. This is the gospel according to Matt. Anybody remember the story in Colorado? The Buffaloes? This is the other two-hour film for ESPN. There's only been two. Survive in Advance is first, this is the second. The Gospel According to Matt. It's a story about a football, a successful football coach, highly religious man, that his daughter had a relationship with the star quarterback, who then passed away with cancer. And through all the trials and tribulations, they still won the national championship. He's a very good friend of mine. Why did I do a story? I'm the only one that he allowed to do a story because I sought his advice. I wanted to surround myself with great leaders and people of achievement in all walks of life. I didn't want to stop. So I asked you the question. What are you developing? What do you got next on the table? The, ever, the, the world of textiles, as Derek mentioned, is changing, evolving. It's cre creating. What are you creating? What are you thinking? What's your next step? What's your next step achievement in life? No matter what the age is, we have to continue to strive for achievement and, and inspire people around us. I have a slogan. We started, uh, my wife and I started a foundation, the Derek Wittenberg Foundation for Education. We provide scholarships for juniors and seniors that have some kind of hardship. So in the last three years, we give away Leon's on my board. Uh, over $200,000 in which NC State has received $70,000. It's not a lot, but it's a start. And we came up with a slogan. This teacher is probably made by somebody in here. And our slogan, you can't see it. This is our t-shirt here. But our slogan is, Dream, Believe, Work. Now finish. A lot of times in life we come up with great ideas. We come up with a plan, a strategy, or something that we believe in. We dream about it. We believe it. It gets tough. We work a little bit. Well, what's the one thing we don't do? All of us have been guilty of this. We don't finish. 87% of the ideas that people put across, they forget about it and they fail. They drop down, and they get wasted because they don't finish. I, I talk to our athletes, all 500 of them. There's no compromise in finishing your experience 
here at NC State. I don't know if you're going to win the championship, but you got to come out of here being a better person. You got to come out of here educated. And you got to come out here being the best athlete you can and enjoy this experience. There's no compromising. That's why I'm wearing this Fitbit. I'm trying to get my steps in right now. That's why I'm not <laughs> I'm constantly a chief. I just told my, my administrative assistant, I beat you yesterday. I beat you. I, beat you. I had you know, 15,000 steps. Finish! And our students the same way, finish! Finish the project. Finish the job. Finish! We've all been guilty of it. I just want to leave you with this. It's very, very important in going forward to really to work your plan at night, every night. Now I was listening to this, uh, uh, this speaker and he talked about allocating your time. And he talked about most people, they get up, they have a routine, they get up in the morning, and they prepare the kids, and then they go to work, the kids off to school, then they go to work, and they come home after five o'clock, and they watch TV, they have dinner, and they go to sleep. They're in a routine in terms of dealing with their time. He said the best time, and I, use, I utilize this time, is from five to 11 o'clock, regardless of what you do to eight to five, is your time to get ahead of everybody else while they're in their routines. That's the time when you're reading and you're studying and you're preparing to work your vision, to work your dream. That's a valuable six hours from the time for eight to five, everybody's in the routine. But 5 to 11, that's where I'm going to beat everybody. Because I'm on the computer, I'm trying to gain knowledge, I'm talking to somebody, I'm texting somebody. Somebody about text is calling me 900 times about, well, you're going to be at the speech, you know what I mean? You're going to be here. <laughs> I like about text hours, they, they was making sure I was going to be here. And I was doing all kinds of research about textiles. I was all excited. I didn't want to come in this building without experiencing what y'all have experienced. This great school. It's the number one textile school in the country. I have to find, I gotta know something. So I wanted, I didn't want to walk in this building. So I'm calling people. And then I quickly found out. This is way too much information for me. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no way. I'm glad Derek Close introduced me because I don't know half of what he knows. <laughs> but I, I used that, that minute. I was trying to find, I was curious. I've been telling everybody, man, you got to go visit textile school. I'm inviting everybody. You get ready to have an influx of about a thousand people next week. <laughs> about the textile school. I'm excited. I'm excited. What you all have done for our economy, our state, our universe, I'm excited about it. It's the best kept secret in the country. And I don't think we sell it enough. I don't think we are passionate enough about it. I don't think we're proud enough about it. But I tell you what, I'm going to be your ambassador. I got people coming. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to work, the, work all these business out, but I, I got them coming. I'm excited. So it's so important for all of us to manage that time and maxima and, and be committed and continue to learn and build upon what you do. You'd be surprised that not only what we do, that others are watching what we do. Watching. Looking at us, our progress, seeing how we operate. <clears throat> Whether you know it or not, you're constantly 
empowering people around you, your students, your family, because they're watching how you operate as a leader. So, in closing, I thank you. I thank Textiles for giving me an opportunity. I was the first athlete to be the commencement speaker for computer science. And they asked me, in Reynolds Coliseum, and I didn't mention one word about athletics. I talked about walking down the Reynolds Coliseum aisle where I played. I talked about my cousin David Thompson, who was a great player who played in Reynolds Coliseum. I talked about when I met Jesse Helms before I introduced the President Ronald Reagan in 1984. I talked about one of my experiences when I broke my foot and they told the doctors told me that I would never play again. But more importantly, I talked to them about the connections and the relationships that made me what I am from NC State. And they really liked my speech, you know why? Because it was nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was nine minutes. Oh, great speech! Oh, oh. <laughs> because you've been to commencements, right? The guy's talking and the grandparents are there. Where is this guy? Come on, man. We got to celebrate these kids. Nine minutes. I timed it. That's why I'm smart. I showed a film. That's six minutes. And I talked for nine. And it's over. But I am humbled and proud NC State. But more importantly, I'm proud to see now the next generation. I'm excited about all the new technology, all the new visions, all the new. I'm excited about what the youngsters are bringing to the table. I'm excited. I was excited to see that lab down there. It was, it was something to watch, to see the enthusiasm of those kids in textiles. So thank you very much. Is there any questions? I'll be happy to take it. There. Yes. I learned how to spell metatarsal the year when you fell on Othell Wilson's foot in Reynolds College, <laughs> <laughs> covering the season for technician. And well, uh, some, somebody may have made the screw in my fifth metatarsal. Oh, no. <laughs> I still have the screw in here. And that's also the first time I did it in high school. Uh, Dr. Stan Levine, which was the Redskins doctor at the same time, made a little plastic plate so it could lay under my foot so it would relieve the pressure. So. That was designed by somebody in textiles, I'm pretty sure. And they used to call that the kind of the, the Wittenberg slab. <laughs> I never, Derek, I never got the royalties from that either. <laughs> I'm learning, Derek. I'm learning. You were thrust into a leadership role at that time, a vocal leader. Everybody thought the season was over. Jimmy V had to become a, a, another, you know, he had, to, he had to motivate you guys to say the season's not over. Everybody thought it was over. Tell, tell us about that adversity and how you were leading the team and letting them know you were healing and coming back. And I thoroughly don't believe you would have won the championship had you not broken your foot and Ernie Myers came in. and uh, The whole team to, made an adjustment. Yeah. We were doing well, well, and I got hurt. But more importantly, I watched uh, Coach Valvano during that critical time. He never, body language never changed. His confidence never changed. Never changed. He coached the team the same way. He made some adjustments, but he stayed the course. He kept the team believing. They didn't know whether or not I was going to come back at all. I, re I still went to practice. I still encouraged the guys. And I, in my deep down in my, my heart, I knew I was coming back because I had done it before. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't notice, but my foot was only 80% healed at the time. I told the doctor I'm playing. I'm not going to end up my career not finishing up, not finishing, even if I had to limp down there. So really, I still, it was a slight bit of pain, but I, I, can, I, can, I just said that we, we're going to play. We'll tape it up and we're going to play. So you have to give Coach Valvano his leadership role in terms of the team, staying the course, body language never changing. And we talked about that through the good and the bad times. Mm -hmm. 
uh, he, he, he stood fast. He, he held it together. He held us together. Absolutely. And then Thurl and Sidney uh, were very poised as seniors. They kept the team together as well. Uh, it was a group effort, group effort in terms of leadership on that team. Good. Yes. Speaking of Coach B, we all know what a great speaker he was for those of us that were here or were not here. We've all heard him. Are you saying that I'm not? I <laughs> 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 <Let> didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> he's from down my hometown, down the shelf. You stole my life. <laughs> As a motivator, when you were playing for Coach B, and he was speaking to you and the rest of the team, how did he motivate you guys to continue to believe in yourselves? And what did you take from that as a coach when you were out there talking to your team? He spent time with us other than basketball. Never talked about when he went in his office. We never talked about basketball. <clears throat> he talked about life. Me and him many times just talked about politics, and he was reading letters or different letters, crazy letters he received from fans. <laughs> but he always made sure that he, he he made that statement. His first press conference I've ever been. I'm gonna look at you as a person, a player, a student, and a player. That was the, that was the order. But he spent time with us other than basketball. And that's what a lot of coaches are missing today. Even Coach K admitted to me at the beginning of the season, you can't get as close to the kids anymore because, because of the technology. They don't go and have those meetings. And the coaches don't do it either. They don't meet with the players. See, the players and, and, and the people that work with you, they know whether or not you care with them other than what you're doing for them. You don't have to tell them. They know. You think they don't know, but they know. It's a field. So we felt that he cared about us. So it's just like if he asked that we cared about us, but we never questioned his leadership. We never said, oh, you, if you run this play, oh, no, that ain't going to work. No, we didn't question it. If we said we got to run 40 laps, let's run it. We didn't question it. Leadership is often questioned a lot because they don't believe or they think they have the answer. We never question because really simple. We believed in him. We, he believed in us. And more importantly, he cared about us. <clears throat> yes? Just a, a quick comment on that and then get a question. When I was at school at State, uh, one of my friends was one of the assistant basketball coaches. I was just out of the rental talking with him, and Bob Mono came up and he introduced me to Bob Mono. This is probably in 82, maybe 83. And he never mentioned basketball. He asked me where I lived, what I was studying, what I wanted to do in life, and so forth. I'm like, this, there's, there's a basketball coach at NC State that's asking me about me. That was very unusual and something I still remember. Is there, I know there's a statue out at, uh, of Balbano out at Attic River. Is there a push or a thought or something about going beyond that name of the floor, putting his name attached to other things in NC State? Uh, I don't know that in particular. And um, I think certainly the renovation of uh, Reynolds Coliseum, if you haven't seen it, is, is beautiful. Wonderful job they did with that and all of our history and Hall of Famers in there. I think that we have a particular uh, trophy case with the uh, K. Yao and Valvano and the videos. I mean, I think that's a wonderful tribute for both. And um, Jim Valvano's legacy is not just NC State. You know, this also is the 25th anniversary of the V Foundation in which we've raised over $200 million, over 600 grants, and we're on another $200 million campaign right now, which we already have the money for. And what Valvano and the team created was an awareness for cancer during the time that Jim Valvano was diagnosed with cancer. It was, it was the least most funded disease, even behind AIDS at the time. 
now there's breakthroughs, there's strides. People are living longer because of the awareness, not just the research. So his legacy now lives on through the V Foundation. So to me, as much as, and I feel what you're saying about NC State, but the V Foundation is a national you know, organization now because of his vision. Remember he said, it may not save my life, it may someone you love. Don't give up, don't ever give up. That's Jim Bob Bow's legacy. Here it is 35 years from now, we're, we're still talking about it. And what he's achieved uh, in, in that realm, in terms of the cancer world, has been unbelievable. Because all of us, somebody that we know, friend, family, is going to be diagnosed with cancer. And it's a disease we have to continue to fight. Yes. May I finish now? Go ahead. <laughs> yes, you've been a wonderful speaker. <laughs> well, like I said before, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm humbled by the opportunity, and I'm excited what Textiles has done and it's going to do in the future. And um, we, like I said, we're going to embrace what we've done here in the past, but we're going to feed our destiny. We're going to feed our destiny. Yes? How can we watch those movies? What's that? How can we watch those two movies that you came out with? Well, that this this one uh, for you is at a discount for a hundred bucks, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, they, I think they're both on Netflix and Amazon, and um, both of these films. And this one is um, is certain uh, Amazon and other outlets. All three of them you can go on social media. They all, all look pretty good. I've watched all of them hundreds of times. <laughs> How many people watch Survive in Advance? Okay. Like I said, the most. Ten times. Huh? How many people watched it ten times? <laughs> ten times or more. That's right. That's right. I have to watch every time I watch it. I'll, I'm almost crying. You know, I didn't want to tell you about one scene. You talk about creative. So players retreat. I think everybody's had a beer in there before. Uh, <laughs> players retreat. And and so I haven't been in the film business, but I kind of know uh, what I want this to look like. So every time we talk about a company or a team, everybody's talking about, oh, the company works great together, and they got great chemistry, and they get along. But you can't see that. You can't feel that. Oh, our family, we get together, and we have these great... You can't see it. You have to let people see it. So I told uh, my director, Jonathan Hawk, I said, let's sit the guys around the players' retreat. And I said, just let us go. Just set the camera, just set the lighting up. Don't talk to us, just let us go. And so for an hour and a half, we just, no script. No script. And Terry Gannon, Telling you, he would have shit his pants about that. <laughs> then he had to buy another pair of hands, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy, enjoy your conference.